Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Nancy and I'm an alcoholic. Because of a loving God, the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous people just like you. I've been sober since November the 7th, 1981. It's a great night to be sober. It's a great night to be sober. Thank you. I, I watched him grow up. And uh, what an honor. Thank you. Thank you for this privilege. I'm going to tell you a little bit about... No. Hey, thank you. I'm going to be taller next time. Okay. <laughs> tell you a little bit about how it was just very briefly i was raised in alcoholism my father was an alcoholic he he said he was an alcoholic and what he didn't know is that when he took the first drink the phenomenon of a craving was going to happen not sometimes and not maybe but he did not know that he didn't he there was nothing he'd had no tools for that my mother was an alcoholic i call her an alligator <laughs> because you know the, she, she wasn't an Al-Anon. She was, you know, they can track you down. They got the big eyes. And, and the reason I tell you that is because when my daddy forgot to come home, because he didn't know how long, he didn't know how long he was going to be at the bar, because I think some of the time he wanted to come home and be with his family. My mother, I learned from my mother that uh, she thought that she had the uh, solution to alcoholism, and that's what, that drinking's bad. People who drink are very bad, and they must be punished. And I want you to know that I developed a hatred for them that it was palpable, an arrogance and a hatred for them that uh, created a situation where my ego and arrogance literally uh, came into the room before me. I found out early on I was brilliant. And, and that's important because even though watching that, watching my daddy drink and, and sometimes say, I won't do it this time, and watching my mother believe to her innermost self that she had this solution, when I left my home, I knew that there would never be a possibility whatsoever, ever not a possibility that I could get in trouble with alcohol. I wasn't like that loser. I said worse things. I'm never being like that. And besides, I had a new car and lived in a really nice apartment. See, those are the things, and I, I'm not going to go on and on. Those are the things that proved to me that I could not be, I could never be like him. And I did all the things that you do to compromise spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. I, I, I compromised myself and gave away my dignity over and over and over again. Then what happened? Somebody else discovered I was did have a problem with alcohol, and she said, "There's a there's a solution. There's an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's, it meets at seven o'clock tomorrow night, and you can go. I'll take you, or you don't have to go at all." Well, in Texas, we call that a double dog dare, right? <laughs> and plus, you got to prove that. Sorry, they're an idiot. So, but I said, I'll go because I want to prove that. And I got all dressed up that night because I knew what you'd look like. And I hope I didn't have a briefcase, but I probably did. <laughs> and I got there early because that's what you do for an uh, interview. And I got to tell you, I did about as little as you can do. Because even though I didn't believe for a second I could be alcoholic, I went back the next night. I don't know why, except the music of Alcoholism, Al- Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went back the next night, and I ran into some people a lot of you know, Dennis Lamphier, Dennis and Linda Lamphier. And they were people who thought you should work the program like all the time. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> no spring break, you know, whatever. I mean, all the time. And I was embarrassed for them one time. They were the greeters at a meeting they were speaking at. But anyway, (laughs) I began to do what they do because they knew 
It works. It really does. And I knew I wanted what they had. And so what does it look like today? I called Dennis one time that, you know, to whine. And it, let me just tell you how hard it was. I said, well, um, and whine, 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 whine. He said, I'm going to get some coffee. I said, okay, I'll wait. And he went, oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> Because when we get when we get back when I get back we're going to get to the exact nature of the wrong, and I have sponsorship in my life that's like that. So after he I got through whining, he said I've got some promises for you. I asked my attention, and he I want to leave these with you because they completely describe my life today. I was promised that if I never took the first drink, I would never be drunk again, and I haven't taken that uh, drink since November the 7th, 1981, and I haven't been drunk. I have not caused the problems to myself or to you, and that promise continues to come true for me. I was promised that if I'd go to meetings, a lot lot of them for you, that I would meet people whose insides felt like mine, even if our outside circumstances would weren't even close, we're, we're not alike. And when I told the truth in a meeting that about the solution, I wouldn't have to explain it because you too would say, I did that too. I felt that too. I was promised that if I studied the literature as opposed to editing and perusing, I was brilliant, that, that I would, that, yeah, any problem I caused or any problem that I had, the answers were in the literature. Why? Because the literature helps us find that higher power and then get closer to it, right? That's a promise that still comes true for me today. I was promised that if I work the steps in order with the sponsor. Now, if you do it, by the way, I've got some new people. If you do a step without them, they get very testy, okay? (laughs) So I did that. I worked the steps, and my life changed because what the promise was is that I could become anybody I wanted to be. I didn't like me when I got to Alcoholics and I, was, I just acted like I did. That arrogance followed, was in the room before I arrived. And so that has been true. It's still true today, no matter what. The big book tells us that it can be about alcohol or it can be about other things. The steps help me create a, a way for me to be the person I want to be. And I'm not that person who made fun at my first meeting. I was promised that God would always be big enough. And I got to tell you, the, the example that always comes to me is I treated my, my um, family horribly. I didn't talk about that, by the way, on the bar stool. It was all about me. I treated them horribly. And yet, God was always big enough. When my daddy got ill, I was asked what to do. And they said, look him in the eye and tell him that you love him if you do. The the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous gave me that love for my father. I got 12 more years with my mother. And when she became ill and we knew that she was going to die imminently, I was in her room, and I used to whine about, did my mother ever rock me? Did she rock me, or did she? Did they love me when I was a baby? Well, I was sitting on the bed and had my arm around her. She had her head on my shoulder, and I was rocking her. Are you kidding me? And that night, I couldn't know. She said, you got to go. You've got a commitment. And she had my sponsor on speed dial. And so she got to go. I said, okay, Mama. Have I told you today how glad I am that you're my Mama? It's a far cry from how I treated her before. And she said, yes. When I left there, um, they had to put her on life support. And I asked them to put the phone up to her uh, to her uh, ear. And I got to tell her one more time. And I said, Mama, I'm going to be okay. And she knew I was okay because I'm staying in the middle of you. So thank you. Thank you for all of you and for Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Luis, I've been alcoholic. All right. yeah, thanks, God. Made alcoholics anonymous. I've been sober since June 22nd, 1982. Grateful for that tonight. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carl, for coming over. You know, 
to the group, you know, asked me to to come and join join you and and be here. And uh, I belong to the Big Town Group. I sober it up over there. I still a member of the Big Town Group. You know, I make meetings most every night. Believe me, okay. And uh, that's my deal. Uh, well, I drink. You know, this is this is what I end up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, and believe me, you think sometimes I thought that there was suffering when I was drinking. No, no, whole lot. We suffer more, you know, when we get in those dry drunks. You know those kind of things that, that nothing goes right in our life. I want to share with you a few little things because we don't have a whole lot of time, you know. And to tell you, to tell you my story, take belief about four hours, and I can't. <laughs> and and uh, those uh, those few minutes over here, with but I will enjoy, and I hope you do also. Okay. You know, I got to the to the big town group because somebody drove me over there and pushed me over there, and I, and I stay at the big town group. And they said, make meetings every night. And I started making meetings every night. And work, we're going to work every day, you know. And uh, three days later, I got me a lady. We're still together. And, and uh, the kids show up, you know. And, and, and uh, you, you heard hear people say, don't make decisions uh, within a year. No. <laughs> But the life continues. I'll tell you what, the life continues. And material things come pretty easy when you're not drinking. You don't spend your money, you know. Something was going right in my life. And another fellow also said from the group, the founder of the group, he said, Hey, you know, I know he said you don't believe in God. Or he told everybody, but I took it. They were telling me, okay. But he said, listen, he said, okay, yeah, get your little guy. Get the little one, he said, okay. As you grow in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that guy's going to grow. And today, I tell you what, my God, it started, just a little bit of one, okay? Put it in my pocket, and it begin to grow, begin to grow, begin to grow, begin to grow. That was the king of the universe, you know? That's a powerful God, okay? Keep me sober. And I hope, you know, as the same God that I got, that's the one you got. But the worst part about it happens to me, that has been, I've been there for a year and a half, two years, but within the time, and nothing was going right. Firing at work. My lady cooked the food, or too much salt or no salt. See, and that, nothing, you know. Sometimes she leave the, the the food in the in the microwave. He said, "When you come back from the meeting, you know, sometimes I go from work to the meeting, and the only thing I had to do is push the the little start button, the start button in the microwave." I just went to sleep because I wanted for her to wait for me at the table, you know. See the kind, of, and, and, and it was going worse and worse and worse, and. Uh, the part about it, I can tell you, when when we are in Alcoholics Anonymous, and somebody tell you, Luis, who you sponsor? The whole group is my sponsor. Please don't do that, will you? <laughs> <laughs> get somebody right quick. We'll get you. You'll get you a sponsor. At least you can talk to them, or whatever. But I tell you what, I don't want to get a sponsor because I don't like people tell me what to do. <laughs> As simple as that, okay? And the pain got bad, I tell you, okay? And the, the same fellow, the same little guy, he said, in front of the podium, he saw me, the head, like, Nancy was stuck at the alligator, something like that, okay? But uh, but the fellow saw my face, and he said, in Alcoholics Anonymous, or you grow, or you go. And I knew what he meant. And I got my sponsor, I'll tell you what. Got my sponsor. And the first thing he's, he asked me, Luis, what do you want to do? Well, I said, uh, 
No, I'm going to back up just a little bit, i tell you. Uh, what's happened in a uh, crop discussion meeting, everybody was talking about the steps. When it got to me, I passed. I passed. We were talking for four, four step, I passed. The third step, I passed. The fifth step, I passed. The sixth step, I passed. All these steps, I just passed. And I was feeling guilty. And I don't know nothing about it, about the steps and everything. And, uh, and, and I had to get, oh, by the way, we used to visit all the groups in Mesquite, you know. We just visited, go to the state. We just visited, you know, they visited us and everything. And one of those fellows said, Elvis, how you feel? I said, pretty good. I fixed it to change groups. I said, okay. I said, why you don't show up over there at the big town, uh, at the freedom group? I believe I'm going to join you over there. I said, okay. And I took off to freedom group. And it was about, freedom group, it was, I'll tell you what, the group was pretty big. And that night it was about 50 people in there. Maybe more. And the chairman, you know, I got the square, and the chairman sit down, and he began to read. He said, tonight we're going to talk about the fourth step. <laughs> I said, God, dog, I said, somebody called, you know. You know that, that, well, 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 I got the sponsor, okay? But what I wanted to share with you right quick, you know, he asked me, what do you want to do, Luis? I'll tell you what, Dan, all I said. I don't, what, what I got you a sponsor because I don't know nothing about these steps. And I feel, I feel shame. I said, you know, that I'm supposed to be here year and a half, two years, and I have, I don't know nothing about these steps. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you. I'm going to at least teach you what I know. He said, okay. You know, I got the book in English, the 12 by 12. I got the 12 in the Spanish. I got, uh, you know, I got all the literature necessary. And he said, let's read. I read. Couldn't comprehend nothing. My brain was like a, like somebody washed it, okay, you know, see? And, 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 and he said, you don't comprehend no answer. I just couldn't comprehend. I'll tell you what he said, what, uh, what are you going to do? Go home, he said, okay. When you lady and the kid goes goes to sleep, go to the kitchen table, kneel down, and there's the man upstairs, he said, okay, to give you some brain, and they begin to write. I did that, I tell you what. Every night I write it, write it, write it, write it, write it, write I go to sleep, uh, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and sleep for uh, two, three hours, and get up and go to work. And, and you know, I wasn't tired. Yes, you know, yes, you know, yes, you know. A week later, I, I, I call him. I'm ready. I said, okay. Be here. We were Saturday. He'll be here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. He was waiting, his, waiting for me at his house. I don't drink a whole lot of coffee still, you know, but he had a pot of coffee. And he said, Luis, have you done the third step? I was going to tell him yes. You know, because a lot of times we always, as soon as we walk to the door and we make the, the third step, one, two, three, and every dog no, is different, believe me. <clears throat> I told him, no, I said, can we kneel down? Oh, sure, I said, let's kneel down. And we read the prayer on page 63. And we begin to, tell you what, we begin to share my fourth step, do the fifth step with him. But the best part about it I can share with you, and this is very important in my life, that's what I'm going to share with you. I share, she share. I share, she share. It began to be a give and take conversation. We finish about five o'clock in the afternoon, see? And he said, how you feeling? I said, I feel good. He said, I tell you what, I feel very good. I said, okay. Okay, he said, you read, you know, go home and read the rest of page 75. And I did what it says right there, okay? I cannot quote, you know, my brain is, I'm 70 years old, you know. I got, <laughs> I got to alcoholics. I don't know, when I was 30, you know, you, you're just a little kid, but I'll tell you the truth, Okay. And then uh, in my brain, you know, it's a little tired now, but, you know, but it's still sharp. Don't get me wrong, okay? But then uh, I went home and read what 
passive with the five stars, especially the bar where it talks about the how we put the foundation, you know. And he told me, said, if you start to see that you remember that you haven't shared with me, call me. He read the five proposals that I read him, you know, went back, went back to page 58, and, and, and I felt, I tell you, I felt good, okay, I felt, uh, 59, sorry, I, I, I began to feel good, he said, now, I said, go to 70, page 76, and do the six and seven. Nobody was at home, believe me. When I got home, nobody was there. He didn't call me, but nobody was there. And one of the things that happens to me, I kneel down and did the six and seven. You know, the room torn white as the snow. And that day, I'll tell you what, I haven't had a desire to go anywhere but Alcoholics Anonymous. Then there's a God, I said, you know, I'm a member now. I'm going to stay up here in Alcoholics Anonymous as long as you need me. And he says in the first tradition, he says, as long as he needs to. That's what we're supposed to be at the meetings. You know, when I start breaking amends, I start do, doing the, the things that I'm supposed to do. I believe me, life has changed. When it talks about, it works. It really works. The steps work. The traditions work. All the services that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous work. I started to tell you what I got, I got in the general service. I started to the DCM, DCM. I went to the area to service a treatment facility. They allowed me the treasury. All, the, all, 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 all the delegate. I, I became delegate, but there was 99, two times. And okay, some of you people regret that I was there, I guess. <laughs> But I serve alcoholics anonymous, I'll tell you what. I know. I put principles before personalities. I'll tell you what. There's one thing that I can say. I love alcoholics anonymous because it has given me a life that I never had before. I'll tell you. Okay. I can go anywhere, you know. I get invited. Again, Carl, I mean, you know, I appreciate you for coming over. I don't know who sent you over there. I don't care who sent you, okay? But thank you for being here. My name's Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. And I've been sober since May 31st, 1982, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. It's... Uh, Nice to be on the old timers uh, committee or panel. Uh, the way you do that is you don't drink and you don't die, you know. <laughs> and um, the uh, and this, uh, you know, I know that we're given grace. You know, God is very good with grace. However, I found there's a difference between grace and graceful. And um, <laughs> I tripped over a cardboard box. So uh, anyway, <laughs> so I have a, a little uh, addition to my, you know, to my. Uh, uh, outfit for the evening. Anyway, um, the uh, you know the topic. You know it works. It really does. I think the fact that first of all I'm standing here, <laughs> I'm sober. Um, um, I am fully dressed, uh, which may not have always been the case, and um, and I'm happy and I'm content and I have peace. You know, and those are some of the things that uh, I certainly didn't have when I first got here. You know, so much of uh, my uh, life, or I look back, you know, was often it's been touched on tonight. You know, as a search for God, and I think that's so much what we find here. You know, I didn't come here looking for God. I came here looking not to drink anymore. I didn't want to do the things that I had done. I didn't want to harm my children anymore. I didn't want to create the messes that I had made. I wanted to show up at work, and they were so glad when I did. And um, I wanted, to, but you know, I I, uh, I couldn't I couldn't do those things because once I took that first drink, all I wanted to do was drink. Nothing was more important to me than drink. I love beer. Oh my goodness, I love beer. I thought if I ever went back out, it'd be on Budweiser beer, you know. And, um, uh, 
you know, the, where it all led me, uh, you know, was down a path of uh, total degradation. I, I had lost every ounce of my own self-respect, my own self-esteem, and most of all, I'd lost my dignity. And, you know, you can you get that by, you know, going to your kids' soccer games drunk. You know, uh, but I got him there. I'm so proud of myself that I got him there. He would rather I hadn't been there. You know, I went to their band concerts drunk. And, you know, it's, oh, goody, mommy's here. <laughs> you know, whoopee. So, you know, those are just the things that, uh, you know, where alcohol, where alcohol led me. And um, I never really tried to stop drinking. Uh, I know there's a lot, you know, we talk about it, but I never made any real attempts. Now, what I wanted to stop were the consequences, and that I truly wanted to quit. I didn't want another DUI. They are not nice, you know. They're very unkind, and um, the policeman was very rude to me, and when I tried to explain to him that I had been a great deal drunker than this, and why was he arresting me tonight, you know? <laughs> and... Um, uh, if you've ever had a DUI, and if you have ever encountered that, uh, do you know they don't chat? Did you notice that? They, they, you can't strike up a conversation. How's the wife and kids, you know? So, um, you know, those are, but it's just that total, you know, loss of ability for to understand reality. And when I was drinking, you know, one of the things I would try to do when I talked about kind of, a, you know, a search for God is that I would get drunk. <clears throat> I know if you ever wonder why they lock churches, it's because of people like me. Uh, I would get drunk, and I, I would want to get into a church. Now, I didn't care what church, you know. Uh, and I tried the St. Monica's Catholic Church. I tried Walnut Hill Methodist Church. I tried, oh, I even tried Temple Emmanuel. The trouble with Temple Emmanuel is it's in a circle, and you know what happens. I kept going in the same door that was locked, you know. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I, I wanted to get in there. You know, now it's a good thing I couldn't because I'm a throw up drunk, you know, so that's probably why they lock doors at two and three o'clock in the morning because they probably before they did that, they encountered a little present someone would have left them, you know, so. The um, thing was, though, what I believed, you know, drinking is that God was in that church. You know, if I could just, you know, I'm, I, I'm crying and I'm, I'm, I have no peace. I have no joy. I have nothing within me. And all of that, those moments where, uh, you know, I knew, you know, that there, I felt hopeless. I felt there was no hope. And if I could just get in that church, if I could, any church, and it didn't matter because I thought God was in those churches, you know, and if I could get in there and I could find the peace and I could sit there and, you know, and then God would be present. You know, I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I've always looked for God out here. And sometimes they are with pe they are people or places or things, and always out here, always out there. And I come in here, and you tell me, no, God's in here. You know, and it's like the and it says the last place I would have looked. But you know, I didn't want to look in there. Uh, there was nothing in there. You know, when I would look inside, all I saw was darkness. And I would, all I could look inside and all I could see were the things that I had done and the way that I had behaved and the actions that I had took. And I came into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you all did the most phenomenal thing for me. You remembered my name. You know, and that is, I would go back, and every time I went back, there was a, a guy, uh, we mentioned some of the older, Danny Edwards was his name, for any of you who may have known Danny. Uh, well, I don't know if you're as old as I am. <laughs> and But Danny remembered my name, and he would ask me how my kids were. You know, and I, he gave me back some of that dignity and some of that integrity that I had lost. He treated me beautifully and like a person. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts that we can give each other. And it's through that process and in that process that I began to find the God of my understanding. You know, this power that um, that we talk about so often, this power that has totally changed my life. And the most magnificent part of it is that it will go on and on and on. You know, the 11th step says sought, not found, you know, and I can continue to go on. And I, 
I will uh, want to be a seeker. I guess if anyone wanted to put a label on me somewhere and further down the road, they would say that she is a seeker because I still am. And I still want to live my life that way. I still want to, to understand uh, the things that I never, ever even dreamed existed. You know, I have so many little things. I've noticed, I had a little thing today, and um, it's the I went to the beauty shop, and I, after after he washed my hair, they shut off the water. And I thought, thank you, God. <laughs> I can't go speak. You know, I mean, I'd have to cancel, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was, um, it, it is just sometimes those little moments to let me stop, let me see, let me see what's going on. Let me see this beautiful world that God has created. And prior to so much heat and, and my graceful uh, manner. You know, I love to walk in the park and I love to be outside. There's one near me and to, to be out in God's world and to see the beautiful trees and to see, feel a little bit of the breeze blow and see the, the, uh, the flowers and to sometimes sit on the bench or some running water and to hear the sound, you know, to be able to enjoy things like that. I was never, ever able to do that ever. You know, I didn't enjoy it. It's like, but what are we going to do? We got to go do, we got to do this. We got to do that. And to sit and to find God in all of these beautiful, peaceful places. And so <clears throat> I'm extremely grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a, a wonderful relationship with these children that I cause so much harm. I have nine grandchildren. <laughs> I have three great grandchildren, you know, uh, I didn't want them, you know, I mean, who wants that? When I came in, they grandchildren weren't on my list, you know, of things. And they just are, they're beautiful, you know, and they love me and I love them. And, uh, and God restored th that relationship. Had I just quit drinking, just stop. I would not have had those relationships. I had to do, you know, what works, what really does work and do what you suggest and do what my sponsor says, suggested and do the praying and asking God for the guidance <clears throat> And, and I have, you know, I have beautiful relationships and it is the only way left to my own devices. I simply cannot do it. So I really, uh, it works. It really does work. And the greatest of it all is this tremendous, tremendous power that we have to tap into. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is John. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Through the grace of God in this program and you people, I haven't had a drink since the 18th of October, 1971. I'd like to thank Brad and uh, all those in f that were responsible for me being here. Well, that would be a pretty big list. Let's just stick with Brad and uh, my fellow uh, panelists up here. Uh, it's fun to be here. It's good to be here. These are great occasions um, of... Uh, gatherings that we have and uh, remarkable things happen. Um, we, we create this group of people and throw them together and next thing you know we got something tremendous going on and, uh, and that's always been my experience at uh, events like this. Um, I, uh, uh, the, the topic I thought was rather broad and, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it gave me a little latitude <laughs> so I'm going to take that and uh, I'm going to talk about moving. No, uh, I'm going to talk about the, to me, the one the, the, the essence of the program is one alcoholic working with another. And uh, to me, I said, everything I say is as I see it. And, uh, and that, we call uh, that kind of a, an arrangement sponsorship. And uh, I was very fortunate that I had a sponsor who made a 12-step call on me a long time ago. And, uh, and he was just... Uh, Backing up a little bit further, I have a rep I had a reputation of in and out, and if I could get like 15 or 20 days together, I thought that was remarkable. And uh, and so I remember asking this one guy to be my sponsor, and uh, and I said, and, you know, that's kind of a, an emotional event, at least it was for me. I mean, you're laying it all on the line, right? And uh, and I asked him to be my sponsor, and he thought a while, and that's always scary when they start thinking. And it's a yes or a no experience, right? You know. And uh, and he said, uh, "I'll be your sponsor if you get 90 days." And I'm thinking, "Excuse me, Roger, but I don't know if I need you if I ever got 90 days." You know. <laughs> so that didn't turn out that great. Uh, but uh, 
any event, so I, I continue to do what most uh, alcoholics do that aren't going to AA or on an abuse or locked up. And I continue to drink, and uh, it was the 18th of October. It was a Monday. It was 1971. And I made another call to the Preston group, and they sent a guy out. And, uh, they sent two guys out, a guy named Clayton Black and another guy named um, Wade Ropp. And, and they came out, and they made a 12-step call on me. And uh, I had a lot of 12-step calls made on me through my career of drinking, okay? And the first thing that always st- – th- I, fr- I grew up in St. Louis, so I, had a, I kind of burned that city down and then moved down here. And, but in St. Louis, I had a lot of 12-step calls, and my first, my first real remembrance of them was they always stayed way too long, you know? <laughs> and uh, I get it. I get the message. uh See you later, maybe. And, uh, and, uh, but Clayton and Wade came in out, and I, at that night, unbeknownst, I had received this priceless gift of a desperation, and I was ready. I, I was ready to do whatever, and, and they swooped, kind of swooped into my life and, and, uh, and took over. And, uh, Clayton was, um, uh, he was just, he was a, a unique work of art, is all I can say. And that, uh, uh, he uh, he first wanted me, the, the first thing he wanted me to do after we met was come over to his house and, and, uh, and, and see him on a Saturday. And I thought, oh, this is great because my wife had already, my wife and Judge Richburg worked it out that I was living by myself. And uh, so I, I went over to Clayton's house and I thought we would sit around and chat about what we were going to do to get Patricia to see the light of day and allow me to move back. And, uh, and so when I got there, I, I was escorted out to the garage where Clayton, Clayton had a woodworking shop in the garage. I used the woodworking kind of loosely. Uh, he, he had wood out there and saws and nails. Okay. And, uh, and we spent the rest of the day making furniture and, uh, and, and that kind of became our routine. And we'd go, I'd go over to Clayton's on Saturdays and would make some of the ugliest crap you've ever seen and be really proud of ourselves at the end of the day. And then he moved on from woodworking. He had, he had, he had trouble with his car running smoothly. So he took a course at Richland on how to rebuild carburetors. And so we switched from woodworking into rebuilding carburetors, which meant we took perfectly good running cars and ruined them. Uh, we, they belched black smoke and mist and f- backfired, and, but that's what we did. And Clayton also was all inclusive. Anybody that wanted to come over and bring and to be, hang out, to do whatever we were going to do was welcome. Clayton just, every you couldn't bring too many people to the occasion, and he would just go about his affairs, you know, making crappy furniture and ruining cars. And, uh, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we would go to an AA meeting. And the significance of this whole experience, uh, I had, I, for some reason, I thought, you know, people said, okay, what we're doing is we're not going to drink one day at a time. And, and, and so somebody said, well, what are you doing next Thursday? I said, I don't know about you, but I'm not drinking, you know. And they actually had an agenda other than that, you know, other than not drinking. And Clayton was the first one that introduced me to the fact that I could go somewhere and I could do some things and I could have some fun and I could laugh and, and, and we'd all stay sober. Now, how in the hell do you work that deal out? You know, because to me, uh, not drinking was punishment. And to have fun and not drink was an eye-opener. It was a new experience, and it was beautiful. Uh, Clayton was my sponsor, I guess, for about gee, 47 years. <laughs> not, a bad, not a bad run. Uh, at the beginning of it, uh, he was, and I selected Clayton as a sponsor. First of all, he would talk to me. And secondly, he would uh, make time for me. And, uh, and, and, and he was open. He was so open with his with his whole family, with his everything he did. I was I could I was invited to, and, and anyone else that was there was invited to that too. His openness was beautiful. I thought, and uh, and I could call him at any time of the day, and 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 he, and he never he never started out with do you know what time it is, you know. Uh, and I liked it, Clayton, so much that when I bought a house, I bought a house about a block and a half from his house. I'm sure he loved that, right? <laughs> because instead of calling, it would be, hey, Clayton, you asleep? <laughs> you know, and uh, 
uh, and, and and he would always answer the door, and it was beautiful. And uh, and and he 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 was a little controversial, uh, you know, and uh, he did some things that that I found unnerving to me. And I remember thinking, talking to my wife about some of the things, and uh, and and, I, and that was the first time I felt that you know I don't have to mimic everything in his life. I can mimic the things he does, which are on the point with the program, as I've now learned the program then in 20 years, you know. And, and I can make some of my own decisions, and I can talk to other people also. And, and, and that's kind of how I evolved in this deal. But Clayton was, well, like I said, he remained my sponsor for a long time. And whenever the, the heat was on and the screws were all the way down, I would call Clayton. And, and we would talk, and I could, and he always said something, he always would say some st stupid joke in response to my profound question, and I'm thinking, are you not hearing me, you know, and, but then at, I would pause before that kind of rebuke, and I think, yeah, he heard me, and, and, and what a beautiful response, what a beautiful response, and, and we're all back down to doing our best and working the program. And then Clayton got on me, and he talked about me sponsoring other people, and and uh, and I love that notion of being involved in other people's life when I'm standing in front of you. Uh, <laughs> When they're calling me in the middle of the night, I'm thinking, do you know what time it is? And, uh, <laughs> but I don't say it. I just think it. And, uh, and, and, and it's been great. I've, I've made a great – the whole notion of sponsorship involves some sort of, I think, a, I'm going to say for want of better vocabulary, like some sort of a leadership role, although it's really not. It's, it's more of a – it is a leadership role in the sense of come follow me. Come, I'm not asking you to do something that I wouldn't do. And, and, and that was what I've learned out of that. And, and I've got the benefit of sponsoring a lot of people today. And, and I don't, I, we don't have like a, a pact, you know, hey, I'm your sponsor, blah, blah, you know. Uh, they call me, I call them. And, and I get, it kind of comes down to, I heard someone say a long time ago, you know, we help each other. One hand washes the other. I need them as more than they need me. I need to hang with them. And, and, uh, we get together, we have breakfast, we, we go out to dinner sometimes, we just, our, our families get together, we get to know families, we get to know other people. And that was always high risk for me, to get involved in another person so deep that, that and what was I looking for? I needed a bailout, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but you ha I had to give up stuff like that. I, to be involved with another human being, to, to give a damn about another human being, uh, it's just spectacular. Uh, I've had some bumps in sobriety. Uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention certain things. My daughter died by suicide uh, two and a half years ago. And those events show up with a warning, you know. They just show up, you know, and it's, one day things are, are great, and the next day they're not so great. Uh, the power of Alcoholics Anonymous is that I can meet what I think is perhaps the worst thing that could have happened to me. I can meet it and deal with it with you. That's what we do here. We, ex we share experience, strength, and hope. We also share tragedy. We're with each other. And I met another couple of people that had a similar experience of loss of a loved one like that. And, and I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, the key to my success, my success being defined as my happiness, the key to my happiness depends upon you and my relationship with you and my, willing, and my willingness to share with you, to, to, to let you know something about me that I just as soon didn't tell you, you know. And uh, and I've learned that in here. And I also learned when this event occurred that there are other people, because of Alcoholics Anonymous and our kindred uh, sticking together with each other through thick or thin. By the way, when that happened, I had more alcoholics pouring into my house. My wife said, you got to write down everything they bring over and get their name. And I said, you got the wrong monkey on that one. <laughs> I, I'm lucky, I, you know, you can use a pen and a piece of paper. There were people flooding in there, and they wouldn't quit. And I, we had food. I could have fed an army for three months. Uh, and, and yet it, that kind of support just, just flowed in. I mean, and, and that's what we call it. We call it support. 
And then I thought, because of this, uh, this Alcoholics Anonymous, because this, this, this uh, success of living, so long as I live with kindred spirits, probably exist in other areas too. And, and lo and behold, I found another person, I knew of another person in AA who, did, who lost their son, and they were in a, program, a suicide survivors program. You know, and so I go on Thursday, first Thursday of every month, I go to a suicide survivor meeting. It all comes back down to the model set by you people, by set by Bill Wilson, and built through the years into this huge mechanism that we have. We call it Alcoholics Anonymous. That kind of shared suffering, the um, the Lasker Award in 1954, we get received a corporate award because we developed and found a new modality for treatment by, use, by, by sharing with kindred sufferers. We got an award for that. No one else thought of it, but it's been copied relentlessly since 1954. I mean, the last count I had, it was in the 90s of the people, organizations that actually wrote to general services to get permission to use our 12 steps. Can you imagine how many just hijacked them you know, <laughs> without writing anybody? I think we'll take that, change the title. I don't want to be associated with an alcoholic. Uh, I'd rather be, a, you know, a, a chronic burglar or something. But uh, 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 the uh, and so I found this other argument. It's the kindred spirit, kindred sufferers. And, uh, and out of this coming together and sharing, powerful stuff happens, man. Powerful stuff happens. We can go on. I can go on. And not only go on, but we can go on and achieve, and we can go on and do the one thing they can never take from us, and that is our love for one another. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.